many were there. I was a 12 month and proud of it. And a son what was in the Falklands. He was what, was he the enemy were there? When he was in the Falklands. When I was on the gate and the armies could have come through, he could have been one of them what were coming through. And he would have come through. But they don't realise what's happened to this community since all the fits have gone. Yeah. How the current has gone down, man. How it's minimum wage all around North Staffordshire. Yes, North Staffordshire is getting better. It's getting cleaner. But there's no money there. There's no money whatsoever. And that mean it. I'd have loved to have my son going down the pit with me. My granddad got his dad a job. My dad got me a job at Florence College. I was there when I was 15. I finished on the Friday. I started work on the Monday. And you took my job away from me in 1993. And I'll never forgive you for that. And that gentleman says he celebrates Margaret Thatcher's birthday. I'll tell you what I'll celebrate when it goes down there. <laughs>
still today own those means of production. That battle goes on. And what we see today is people in British Airways, we see the postal industry, we see them having ballots with a 95% success rate, and the law means that a judge can say, you haven't, you haven't consulted one or two people, you've got to go and do it all again. That's how you tried to shift and did shift the balance of power. And when working people wake up and realise that what we need is a change of the political system, then perhaps we'll redress the damage that you did and begin to fix this broken society. I'd just like to ask the question why pits aren't being opened. We could have new pits with, with the technology we have now and the means to have clean burn. And it's nothing, to do, with clean clean it's clean nothing clean. to do with global warming at all. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. In fact, CO2 is not a major contributor to global warming. We've had, That's there, not what we're debating. No, I know, but you started the debate mentioning coal and global warming. Wait, 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 now, you did, actually. No, you, you, you wait, sat wait, here and you said global warming. In point of fact, clean burn technology means we can have coal, we can have new pits. Why aren't we opening new pits? Okay, that, that girl has been, uh, has been very patient, madam. Thank you. Sorry about this. You just have your say. And sir? First ones. First ones. I know. I was not on any particular side. I was three months trying to take the place. I don't really understand the arguments and that's what I'm here to listen to. But George Galloway's point that it's a green fuel, it might be green for the next 100, 200 years, but what happens after
uh, replace jobs and uh, a good social fabric is drugs, gang culture, um, despair. Um, and, and the thing is, is that when the arena says young people wouldn't go down the mine, but go down the mines now, um, what young people want is dignity of labour. And uh, people don't want to do any job where they're going to be treated uh, appallingly by their employers. Um, they don't want to work in call centres when they work when on minimum wage, uh, where you're not allowed to go to the toilets and things like that, not allowed access to a union. Uh, people would work in mines if, we, if um, it was marketed properly by the government, it was publicly owned. If investment was put into it to make it um, cleaner, both in terms of environmentally, but also the working conditions, you would only cost a fraction of what we spend on tribes and wars abroad, which Mr. Galloway's yeah. 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 If I can offer some advice, I think really you should be speaking to working class people and get their uh, assessments of things yes. um, before you uh, form that, that opinion. Thank well, you. Thank you. entirely through the state system, yes. and I'm very proud of where I've come from, and you can be probably go into my voice. So, uh, you know, don't lecture me about the working class. This is where I come from, too. I suspect you don't, actually. But there I, you I, go. I, I, I actually said correct point. Uh, my, my father actually was on the People's March of Jobs. Anyway, my blood is good. Yes, you lad, my blood is as good as yours. Right, so now then. When it comes to jobs and work, there are two issues that this country faces and which are very difficult to resolve. And they're not going to be resolved by anybody going on strike or taking over uh, means of production and so on. The one is the cost of labour. We're a high cost labour country. And that means that when we try and compete. No. Oh, yes, we are. Yes. Yes. You are. But you're out, of, you're out of date. You're out of date. That. When you compare the cost of labour in this country and what people will work for and the standards that they require in which to work, it doesn't compare with countries like Malaysia or Poland or a number of other countries. And that's an issue we have to face. The other is, whatever we make, we have to sell it. And we have to sell it in a world which, however much you kick my like and a few other people, there are no trade barriers in effect. And that means we have to sell it. We have to sell it to people, to customers who have a choice about what they buy and what they pay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. That's, that's the way of the world. That's the way of the world whether you're in Russia, that's the way of the world whether you are in Poland, that's the way of the world whether you're in the States, and it is very much the way of the world if you're in Staffordshire. What troubles me is that here we are, the pound down, and it looks like it's going to be down for some time, and actually nobody is coming forward to start manufacturing in this country, taking advantage of that, and, and selling overseas, and taking advantage of our monthly <coughs> currency. That's an opportunity, and I can't see anybody doing it. I, that seems to me is a real missed opportunity. We should be manufacturing and selling overseas from here. Yes, yes, George. The Greener says that we have to sell what we produce, but we're buying other people's coal, and we're buying other people's oil at a price that would make profitable virtually every pit that had existed in the country in 1984. On our overarching point, that you are a high-cost labour force, well, a system that depends on us working for coolie wages is a system that isn't worth having, is it? Well, quickly, but I'll okay. go on. What Ed Wheeler says might have been true in 1960 about the cost of coal, it isn't now. The UK actually produced now the cheapest coal in Europe, including Poland. So, you know, because of our technology and the way we do it here in this country, and that's why we should be reopening the pits. We should be reopening the pits and have a clean burn, I keep saying this, clean okay. burn generator. Thank Sorry. you, right, well, so we made anyway. that point, I think. Could we move on to Steve Dunn's question, please? Steve Dunn. Is he here? Steve Dunn. Yes, um, I don't know. It's a really passionate debate I'm here. The question is kind of a bit of a, well, a tangent, really. But I want it to David Hank. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like a, it's like a two-parter, really. A first bit to George. 
and the second bit to um, the rest of the panel. Uh, first bit to George. Uh, Chris no. Hutchins, uh, George, um, refers to you as a hypocrite and, quote unquote, a, not just a pimp, but a prostitute for dictators. Okay? <laughs> So the first part of that is, do you think you've got a point, or do you think he's completely off his trolley? I'm not sure what it's got to do with it. Yeah. No, I don't know any that's needed in British politics. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you know I can read, so you're very good. Give me a question. Okay. Dave. Well, 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 what I would say is I think you do need a far more radical, despite being described as a revisionist, approach, because what we have got is um, a new Labour movement that's moved to the centre. Uh, a Cameroon type, uh, sort of somewhere in the centre, but it's not very clear. And the Lib Dems all over the place, frankly. Uh, all of the parties, well, I'll just give you one, one example. The latest research reckons that the cost of bailing out banks when we introduce major uh, cuts in public spending will probably mean two 190,000 people are going to lose their jobs. In the, and I'm quoting an independent research study that I came across, and rather to my surprise, or perhaps it shouldn't be to my surprise, it doesn't seem to be covered in the national press, for, funded by the Gatsby Foundation, an independent group, have looked at this and said there's going to be, on top of what we're talking about tonight, 25 years ago, we're going to have, like, we're talking about 8,000 jobs going in Newcastle, 2,000 jobs going in Swansea. Because if the, and the real danger at the moment is there is just a total consensus, as far as I can see, among all the parties, oh, we've got to do this. And I'm sure we will say, well, probably we do have to. But I actually think that if you're going to do this, you're going to get a sway. We're talking about the minor strike 25 years ago. We're now going to get across the whole public sector, sort of people's living standards dropping in all our major cities when they've never really recovered, actually, in the last 25 years. And I'm talking about Liverpool, thing. the only areas they could find, and this is quite interesting, it shows you how small our industrial base is. The places that won't do, won't fall in this way, are Oxford and Cambridge. Cambridge mainly because it's a high-tech um, area that is a small but uh, and Oxford uh, frankly because they said they raised student fees and therefore the universities won't sack the staff because they get more money and frankly if we're going to come to this area I really think there's got to be a radical rethink because I don't see why the country should have to go through another thing equivalent to the minor strike to pay for what was absolute uh, get casino gambling by the bankers with our money because there's been no, at least Obama is beginning to think on one point and one should distinguish between what a bank is and what a casino is under investment. And frankly, I think there is a point. And I actually might be old fashioned enough to say that the Attlee government is the best government that Britain ever had. I'm sure you would disagree. Because the Attlee actually, I mean, he didn't deal with journalists at all. Well, they sent something, really. And when you had a ticker tape in Darling Street, he put it in the NUC, so it was seen with cricket screens. But actually, he went through, rather like saying, we're facing a crisis, foreign war, what do we need to do? We need a decent national health service. We need to actually bring into state ownership. And I mean, even a Labour government, when a private railway companies have failed, is stupid enough to put them up to sale to someone else when they've got them free. <laughs> so perhaps, and I just think that there's got to be, uh, and frankly, I would quite like to see a return to the spirit that actually had in 45 in changing this country. And it would probably mean a big clash with Edwina. I don't yeah. know what uh, they're Ken, thinking. Ken, 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 Ken. I think that there, there is a really important question here that you've, that you've raised. And, and that's the problem of representation. And we're getting a sense of it here tonight amongst what people are saying. Because we have uh, a Tory government which is pro-business. We have Labour, new Labour, which when it came to power, its slogan was Labour means business. Now, uh, we thought it meant that we're going to roll their sleeves up. Actually, it meant we mean we are supporters of big business. Is actually what Labour means business means. 
It is, it, it is, and that is, is one of the consequences of the miners' trust, because it pulled politics to the right, and the Labour Party, under the, the, the leadership of um, first John Smith and then Kinnock, uh, lamentably Kinnock, uh, who cleansed the Labour Party of its left, uh, meant that it was no longer a broad coalition, it was a party of apparatchiks and careerists, and now that Labour Party is, is is, is a Tory party in its essential political nucleus. Because every politician, every policy that it espouses is to, is to set the ground rules for business to make profit. And that's Brown's way out of this crisis. I mean, they say ideology is dead. When the banks, they were forced to take the banks over, they didn't actually direct the investment for our jobs for, to make things we need, to set up jobs where there would be apprenticeships and um, proper working conditions and trade union rights. No, they, they give it back to the bankers to gamble because that's the only game they understand. So we have a real problem of representation. <coughs> we have the Liberals, of, of course, our party of business. So we have, we have a Labour Party which pretends <coughs> to represent the interests of working people but actually, it pretends to, to represent their, their feelings or, or their culture or whatever. But actually, their politics represent the interests of the ruling class. And all the political parties do. So we have a real problem of representation. And that's really, that's, that's a dangerous position to be in. Because if your political system doesn't acknowledge and doesn't, doesn't reflect the divisions in society, you cannot have a democracy. You can't have a meaningful political discussion because the two parties, the two elements in the society are not represented. So we have a real problem of representation. And I think it's been a problem on the left. And it's something that George and I have talked about, and other people here will have talked about, is that we, we've witnessed a historic failure on the left to bring together all the people who, and there are many in this room, and think of this room <coughs> replicated over and over again around this country. Many, we're not untypical. There are many people here who would be agreed on a broad left program. And that's what we need a movement for, that's what we need a party for, and that's our real opposition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Alan Windsor, and this is from Mike Natural. We have one we have one party in Westminster, it's called actually the Lib Lab Con. And they're a single issue party, and their single issue is let Europe rule and we'll sit here and take the money. And what's happening is they're taking our money and they are relocating our industry into Europe by subsidy with the money you are paying in taxes. <coughs> this country is still the sixth largest economy in the world. It was the fourth in 2004 when I was elected. And the way we're going, we'll go down and down the tables because what you and I are doing, we're paying our taxes into a regime that appears to be moving all the industry abroad. It isn't just supply and demand, it is actually being done by subsidy, and I can give you actual examples if you care to ask me. So, what we're doing is undermining ourselves by being part of the EU and allowing them to do it. Full stop. Very interesting hearing uh, Ken talk about the broad left. I haven't heard anybody talk like that for a very, very long time. Well, you should get that um, <laughs> It's a democracy. It's a democracy, Ken. Get together your broad left coalition and stand and see how many people will vote for you. And you all know in your heart of hearts, it won't be very many. It won't be very many. Uh, because one of, the, one of the problems I think this country faces is that many of the ologies and many of the isms I think are now outdated. Um, I'm, I'm not going to analyse the whole lot. The whole lot. I, what I would like to see. We, we all know what's going to have to happen in the next couple of years. Um, my fear is that we have a hung parliament and we don't have a government of any strength to start doing it. But it will need to be, there will need to be some changes. What I would dearly like to see is somebody asking the kind of question in this country that President Pompidou asked in France in 1970. 
He gathered together some of the best brains and he said, at the end of the century, in other words, about a 30 year period, what will France be exporting? And what they came up with, he invested government money in, in long term research and support. They came up with, oh, people will be using more nuclear power. So France switched over to nuclear power. And they are the only country now that has got a, a proper nuclear power system. Uh, and in fact, they, they sell to us 20% of our energy comes uh, under, the, under the channel from the French nuclear power. The well, second one they said was people are going to be using trains. And so they developed the TGV. The third is people are going to be using short haul but fuel efficient aircraft. So they developed the Airbus, and most of its work is done in France. And the fourth thing is, oh, people are going to be using satellites, 1970 satellites. <laughs> and what they're going to need is they're going to need a propulsion system. So they have the Ariane ro rocket. And every time one of those goes off, nearly all the satellites in space now are, are sent up by French uh, rocket. Minute, what this means is, wait a minute, what this means <laughs> is that that was a government that was thinking ahead and that was prepared to invest state money, taxpayers' money in it. I'm waiting for a government in this country well, you to ask the same questions. Well, you were in for 18 years. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And one of the key things that we did, one of the key things that we did and that we pursued in South Derbyshire was exactly that. What were people going to be making in the future? And the people in the, the whole area is much more prosperous and much more diverse. This is what a future government, I don't care who is in charge. I don't care who, what colour they are, or where they come from, or which school they went to. But that's the kind of question that somebody has to be asking in this nation of maybe 70 million so. What are we going to be making and selling and exporting in the future? And until that question starts to get answered with some very thoughtful and blue sky thinking, then I'm afraid we're going to continue to be in a mess. Okay, thank so, you. The gentleman there. The left is alone, so we've been selling coal abroad. Thank you. Thank you. So the gentleman there.
Sorry, we can't go ahead. That's why Scott was not stuck by the stuff. Thank you very much, best let's make this is, isn't the big problem with politics today that a spokesman would become a conservative party is everybody is talking about reducing the deficit and they're not talking about investing in the infrastructure we will need in the future. Yes, we do need to reduce the deficit, but we also need to invest in the industry and the service sector, which will mean the country can grow in the future. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, it is, of course, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just excuse me, man. <coughs> the fact is, at the end of the day, what I'm pleased about tonight is that we are letting you have your head, and I think it's absolutely right and proper. It's good to see the passion and the commitment and the reality because you're educating me too. But it's also about the young, and it's their voice that we want to hear as well as ours. So I thank you very much for that question, that uh, comment. Now, uh, just very quickly, so we can then move on. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, That's great. Just a, a, a quick question, really, for Edmina Curry. Um, I'm a member of the Goldfield Community Campaign. I've been, been on there for a few years. Um, two things, really. Firstly, in the Margaret Thatcher's book, the Dallas Street Years, there was a section about the mine strike, and there was a quote in there that said that this country owes a massive debt to the working miners of Nottingham. Does Edwina think that this country has actually paid those working miners that debt that Margaret Thatcher said that we all owed them? Uh, I think not. Uh, I think moving forward, though, um, when I think about this area, North Staffordshire, we have lost, if you look at traditional industries, we've got um, the pop banks, steel, coal, textiles, all of which are a massive hit right across the country, but concentrated here in this area. And this area, I know all, all of us, South Wales have had problems, Scotland have had problems, the North and the North West have had problems, but this particular area has had male unemployment, has particularly had massive, massive hits. And I'd like to know what the thoughts of the panel are. First of all, I'd like to know, has any of us heard about the, the Coalfields Community Campaign, which was started, that left a, a massive, that people saw the void that was there in mining communities. And for four years, when John Major was the, the, the Prime Minister, we knocked on the door and there was nobody listening. There was nobody listening at that time. Coming? He wasn't there. Coming? He was somewhere else. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. And they're not all in the city of London. Uh, there are there are very anyone that plays video games, for example, will know some of the successful businesses and industries we have in this country. Uh, anyone that's involved in the media world, some of our biggest exports come from the BBC. There's a whole host of things that we do. One of the, one of the problems is there isn't enough of that. We have been over the last decade far too dependent on the city of London. And City of London money is, is volatile. Sometimes it didn't even exist, as we've discovered. So we've had a, a, a severe imbalance, I think, in the way the economy has developed in this country. But the future, it seems to me, has to lie in asking that question, the, the Pompidou question, which is, what are we going to export 30 years from now? And what do we have to do to support that? That's the question about infrastructure. And infrastructure isn't just about roads. Infrastructure is about fibre optics. Infrastructure is about fast broadband, which we don't have in Britain. They have in Paris, but they, we don't have it in this country. We seem to be more than happy with slow digital speeds and so on. Um, but somewhere along the line, we've got to gear up into the century that we find ourselves in. And it isn't going to involve us getting dirt under our fingernails. It isn't going to, it is, it isn't going to involve people going underground, however much you might want it to be the case. But it does involve getting involved in a whole host of new businesses, new industries, new patterns of education are needed. Education is the most important of the, all the infrastructures. And I, I wait to hear the political party, including the one I've been a member of for 40 years, starting to talk like that. When they do, I've no doubt that Somewhere along the line, somebody's going to be a, a, a naysayer. 
But that would be a party very similar in many ways to what Margaret Thatcher was trying to do, was to drag the country into the future. Thank you. Right. Uh, uh, can I just move on to the next question, please? Uh, this is from Alan Windsor, and it is for Mike Naturals. Alan Windsor? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that the panel can answer this question. That is Jeff. That's my country first. Is it the microphone that's not I appreciate it. My country first. It's the other side of the floor, so you can do as they're waiting on. And then if it's the other panel members' country, please. And then, and then perhaps get some feedback from the, from the audience. They're grateful to expand my knowledge for the benefit of towns. Question very short one. 25 years on, how is the demise of the coal industry benefiting the country? It hasn't benefited the country. Why do you think I would say otherwise? I believe in the coal industry. I think you say no, I'm going to ask you your views. Okay, well, the demise of the coal industry has actually worked against this country because there are so many other industries that rely on it and open up around a coal field. Not just the steel industry, but all sorts of other smaller industries. And also, of course, the retail and all the other add-ons and service industries. It was a disaster for this country, closing, closing the coal fields. Of course it was. And what I said at the beginning of this was it was a, and all because it was an argument be between two people that wouldn't shift. It was, it was two people that wouldn't, if they'd have just negotiated properly. But of course, the government of the day wanted to close the coal industry because they were sick of, they were sick of, as they saw it, the power of the unions. They wanted to kill the unions. That was entirely a wrong decision, but that's what they did. And I, I keep saying, coal is in again now. Somebody said, it's expensive. It isn't actually. This country produces the cheapest coal in Europe at the present time, including coal mined in Poland, because we've got the technology. It's different technology now. We do it in a different way. And clean burn is very important. People keep saying CO2 and stuff. Look, burning coal is a lot cleaner than your incinerators they built. They, they are building incinerators all over the place to burn rubbish. That rubbish has got mercury lighting in it. It's got all sorts of batteries. It's got also. I'm just. To, excuse me. Uh, let me finish. I'm making a point. The stuff that the stuff that goes up the chimney is filthy, and that is cleaned. So if you can if you can get mercury out and get lead out, coal is a pussycat. You can burn coal and have clean burn, no problem. And somebody keeps shouting, uh, "How many years is that going to last?" Well, if it lasts 200 years by that time. I'm sure in 50 years, never mind 200 years, we will have different technology. We'll have far different technology to carry us through, but we still need coal. We need coal because oil's running out. Um, unless we have nuclear fuel, and I think there should, I really do think there should be a competitor to nuclear, and don't start shouting at windmills all the time. They're not viable. They're not viable because the subsidy on windmills, you have to subsidise them in order to, to get even anything out of them. They're not viable. Look at the figures. Go back to coal and let's have nuclear to support it. But basically, we're miss missing out on coal. David, That's my let, let the panel, excuse me, let the panel, because the gentleman asked for the panel to answer his question, correct? Thank you. Well, well I would say, actually, there still is a role for coal. A lot, and I would disagree with you over wind power. Actually, <laughs> wind power is capital intensive to build. Yes. And furthermore, we don't see the one wretched place we had that was uh, going to make it on the Isle of Wight ended up being uh, closed down following, frankly, campaigns, I'm afraid to say, being by the Tory MP. <laughs> uh, excuse me, they won't work without subsidy. Coal will. Well, well, a lot of Well, I'm not Coal will. Let him, let him, let him. I mean, so I, A, because it's a renewable source, I think it's an important source. Um, I actually think that the destruction of the coal mine, the scale of it, I mean, pit closures, we forget this, weren't new. They didn't, they weren't no pit closures. In fact, there were a lot of pit closures, but they were negotiated and done with a fair amount of dignity, or they tried to, until that strike which then ended with the destruction of both uneconomic pits yeah. and economic, and worse than that, a yeah. lot of economic pits, or pits were made to be uh, uneconomic. And there is, a, there is actually a considerable room for us, at least in the medium term, to have coal, uh, so that we're less dependent 
effect, actually, on oil which is, and gas in particular, which is going to come from, um, from abroad as well. And on top of that, I, I, I might add, I am always worried about nuclear power, they say there are never any accidents in the nuclear industry, but we only need one for the country to go to the world. So coal is much safer than that. So. George, would you like well, to I, I feel a lot more comfortable about nuclear power if you didn't have to dress up like a spaceman to go into work. Station doesn't look all that safe uh, to me. Now, 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 we know the, now we know the future as seen by Edwina. It's making video games. <laughs> when, when, the Tories, when, when the Tories came in, when the Tories came in, when the Tories came in, Britain had a coal industry, a steel industry, a shipbuilding industry, a car industry, a truck industry, a motorcycle industry, a railway workshop industry. We were a workshop of the world. Yeah when the Tories came. We were a workshop of the world when the Americans were still riding the range as cowboys in the Wild West. And look at us now, looking to a future of video games. And the idea that there's something wrong with subsidy is a triumph of accountancy over economics. Accountancy is about counting numbers. Economics is about the bigger picture. Because you close down a mine, because you won't subsidize it, and then you subsidize the unemployed for generations afterwards. Yeah. You close down the mine. You close down an industry rather than subsidize it and end up spending hundreds of billions and the lives of hundreds of thousands for wars overseas in order to make up for what you had yourselves and you destroy it. These people are economic illiterates. As Oscar, Wilde, as Oscar Wilde put it, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And they certainly don't know the value of a community that goes to work every day, which has a real community, neighbors, workmates. And anybody who's toured the wasteland, they say April's the cruelest month, do it next month. Tour the wastelands that these people left behind them and see the human dereliction, never mind the physical dereliction that they left. And you'll never dare dream of re-electing this mob ever again.
ladies and gentlemen, this is, you know, it's lovely we can go on with this all evening, but we are getting short of time, so I'm going to try and move it a little forward and don't, don't, uh, just relax, we'll get as many, many of you involved as we can. Now then, this is from Phil Burton Cartridge, and I would like this to go to Ken Loach, please. Have you, Mr. Phil? It's all right, I won't need a microphone. All right, thank you. For Ken Loach. Um, do you think, um, uh, do you think, How different would be? You said, one well, of the question was that I got was, had the miners won the strike, how different do you think Britain would be today? Would it be better or worse than this, correct? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a very um, interesting speculation. Um, I think it would have transformed Britain, because I think in order for, for the miners to have won, all the uh, support that they got would have transformed the political institutions there would have been a movement of the left that would have been in power. Right. Because the, the energy that would have been generated from a miners' victory, and of course it was possible, uh, as George was saying earlier, if the, the, the unions had actually stopped, pulled the plugs, we, we could have won. I say we, I would assume. Yeah. Support of the strike. It could have been won. Because nothing moves without workers moving. Nothing Nothing is, is produced without workers producing. The power is there, so it could have been won. If it had been won, yes, it would have transformed. It would have transformed us politically because there would have been no new labor, uh, there would have been no illegal war, uh, there would have been no Margaret Thatcher of the rest, uh, other industries would have been protected, um, we could have moved to a planned society. So I think it, it would have transformed us. It would have transformed the BBC, I think, for one thing, because they wouldn't have, they'd have, uh, they'd have had to apologise for reversing the footage of uh, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a bit pleased to hear Edwina supporting the BBC. I guess her party won't be called for a cut of the license fee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very uh, interested uh, that when the Queen's footage was reversed and she was shown... Uh, backing off in the house when she actually she was working forward, uh, somebody lost their jobs. When they put the, the pictures of the miners um, throwing stones at the police, and then they put the police attacking, yeah. of course when it was shot, the police were attacking and then the miners retaliated, and they reversed it. Um, I mean that's a symptom of something that may, would have been interesting to talk about tonight if there were signs. Just how, how the state operated against the miners. In every aspect, uh, it operated through the police, it operated through the intelligence services, it operated through uh, international deals where scab coal was brought in through Rotterdam and so on, fed into non-union ports, and it operated most uh, eloquently through the media, through television, through broadcasting, through the press. and. Um, that, that goes back to 1926, to the general strike, when the BBC, which was run by Lord Reeve, the founder at the time, and uh, he was under pressure from, this is time for a quick story, he was under pressure from Churchill, who ran a newspaper during the general strike called the British Gazette, and Churchill wanted to requisition the BBC and use it as a mouthpiece for government. And Baldwin, of the Prime Minister, one or two others, said, don't be so hasty. It's much better that they think the BBC is objective, because then they will believe them. If you use it as a propaganda rag, of course they won't believe it, and we lose our, one of our best weapons. And so, of course, the BBC, ever since, has maintained this notion of impartiality. But at the time of the general strike, the news bulletins were written in a government office. And they might well have been written in the government office for the bias shown against the miners in this province. Would you like to respond? Uh, I have the greatest respect for Michael Foote. He was a decent, 
honourable, well-meaning, extremely bright man from an astonishing family who's given great service to this country. And just a minute. And just a minute. The trouble was, he, he did what some of you have done here tonight. He would stand up and make fantastic speeches. And everybody would cheer. And they would march on. And the trouble was, he was speaking to the converted, just as you've been doing. And outside, people were saying, no. Margaret Thatcher was elected. The Conservatives were elected in 79. They were elected in 83 with a huge majority. They were elected again in 1987. Whatever happened in the miners' strike, that was likely to happen. The nation, the population in this country, and something like 75, 77% used to vote then, were voting for change. They were voting for the future. I have people coming to my constituency, into the, into the uh, surgery device group, the wives, not the men, very macho industry we've been talking about, but the wives saying quietly, do you think there's any chance of getting gas installed in our villages? Because we're sick and tired of clearing out the cleaner at 7 o'clock in the morning. We want to have the same life as everybody else. And that was all we were trying to do, was to try and give them, and I, you may or may not accept this, but I think people here are pretty fair-minded, but actual Conservative MPs elected to represent mining areas were trying to do exactly that, exactly what you want, trying to give the people there a good life, a prosperous life, a future, one in which hard work and effort and brains were going to be rewarded. But we all knew it was going to be a different life from, from the life of a hundred years before. It had to change, and it has to change again now. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Are you trying to say that the Tories were elected in 79 to crush the miners? The Tories were elected in 1979 because the miners, well, because strikers had brought down the last government, which happened to be a Labour one. Oh, that was the manifesto. Have you forgotten that? That's why people voted Conservative. They've had enough of strikes. They've had enough of it. And when it came to 1983, they voted Margaret with an even bigger majority. Yeah, and that's why she fought the Margaret, and that's why she won. But there's a gentleman, the gentleman there that's been very special. Well, really, he's another one. And he's another one. 25 years ago, 50 folk were elected as Conservatives in the Conservatives. I said to my father, I want you to go with your friends in the pit. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do with your son. Put your foot in that cage, and I'll break both your legs. It's a dirty, dangerous job. Now, the last 30 years of my working life was in a mortuary, and I've assisted in literally thousands of post-mortems on miners. I've had to talk to miners' relatives. It is a dirty, dangerous job, and I have the utmost respect for miners, so you know where I'm coming from. Now, one thing is, I've just been elected as a councillor, and the first thing I was told is, you are politically naive. A gentleman over there said Westminster is a live lock, live lock con. If not, it's a dirty big con. And it's the same with local governments. I don't trust any politician. I joined the council. I didn't trust the opposition. And then I found out even in my own group, I didn't trust them. So tonight, what I, what I really would like, I would like the panel, and, and this is an only straightforward question, to get all this cargill. Forget Mrs. Thatcher. Look at the situation we're in today. Exactly. We're sitting on thousands of tons of coal. We've got unemployment. Yeah. We're buying coal in. Now, I would like the panel to tell me there's an election coming off soon. If you were now going to form a government, what would your priorities be? Good question. And who would like to... Well, I'm now on the South in uh, Westminster. So maybe... Uh, I should answer that. Ken, Ken Lodge and I are members of the Respect Party. <coughs> and if anyone's interested in our ideas, they can go to the web, to the Respect Party uh, website and see where we stand. We hope to elect three members of Parliament in just 60 days' time. Two in East London and one in Birmingham. And if it's a hung Parliament, I hope it's a hung Parliament, depending on three votes. <laughs> and if it is, if it is, well, stranger things have happened. If it is, our conditions for supporting our government will be this. The uh, start is made to a major national house building drive to house the overcrowded and homeless people 
in many parts of the country, giving a boost to the construction industry, the steel industry, and the other industries that are, uh, because investment in construction is tremendously productive in job creation because of the sheer number of different trades that are involved in construction and the making of the materials. Secondly, that we use our ownership of the banks, our ownership of the banks, which we never asked for, but for which we paid through the nose, to use those banks to reinvest in resurrecting British manufacturing capacity. Reopen the coal mines that have not been irrevocably flooded and invest in clean coal technology. And last but not least, a date we set for the withdrawal of British forces from the foreign wars that we've been sent into around the world, not least because we have no energy and fuel industry of our own, and save those young men from being killed in foreign fields for the fat cats that Edwina Curry represents. Well, George mentioned a hung parliament, and I think they all should be hung, basically. <laughs> I, I think they should be hung as traitors for two reasons. First of all, they've sold our country away to a foreign power. And secondly, they've sold away all our industry and betrayed the working man, and, and betrayed in so doing so the entire fabric of this country. It's time we in this country ruled our own, our own government, made our own laws, provided subsidies if necessary to industry, but not everybody can be on a subsidy, because if everybody's on a subsidy, there's no money to subsidise. So we have to, look at, we have to look at economics, and we have to be choosy, but the coal industry won't need subsidy. I'm telling you again, we make the cheapest coal in Europe at the moment. It's statistically there. And again, I'm telling you, there's 200 years in deep mine coal, and even more in open cast that you won't want to talk about, because I know I, I helped the open cast survey as a chartered surveyor many years ago and they're hiding it all over the place in case of an emergency. We've got loads of energy in this country, plenty of time to find out new technologies to bring us on for energy in the future. Yes, UKIP would go nuclear, but UKIP would also invest in coal and clean burn because it is clean and it can be done. Only look at your refuse incinerators, you'll see if they can do it, we can burn coal and make energy as easy as wind. And that's, that's my message on coal. Okay, Edwina, please. Thank you. I, I think most people realise that the first thing any government has to do, whether it's a hung parliament or not, is do something about our horrendous deficit. Because if you we don't... Try, well, now listen. Because if we don't do something about our horrendous deficit, British sovereign debt will be downrated. And then you really can all worry about pensions. Then you can really all worry about all sorts of aspects of the way that the economy runs. And this would be a, a, a serious lurch downhill in ways that could not be put right uh, for a very, very long time. That's very, very important. It's got to be done. Um, David Cameron said that what he wants to do is cut taxes on business. I'd add to that. I would, I would do something slightly different. I'd do what Russia has been doing, which is cut taxes on everything. Russia has a flat rate tax. It's 13% it's tax on income, wouldn't that be nice? It's 13% tax on, uh, on business profits, corporation tax. That would be lovely. And it's 13% tax on expenditure, on the VAT. What you do then, as, as, as we found out over 20 years ago, is actually more money comes in. More money comes in because more people are prepared to come to register their businesses and to pay the taxes and then you've got more money with which to do all the things that George wants to do, that I want to do, whether it's infrastructure, uh, whatever it is. But at the moment, at the moment, we've been spending money we do not have. We've all been spending money we do not have and the government in particular. And until that is put right, we're not in a position to make any decisions about the future. That's got to be the priority. David Well, well I, I actually, I, I would disagree with quite a bit of this. One, um, when you say we've been, we've been spending money we haven't had, 
we've actually been spending money giving it to bankers who basically nearly bankrupted the country. It's not, I mean, I wish we had been spending more money on services, but actually most of it was going to... Yeah, the health service is not important. No, the health service is important. We have spent some money. It's not improved? Uh, yes, it has improved. Of course it's but, 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 well, but, 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 I, I think there were, two, there were things I would watch. I would not actually rush to cut the deficit immediately. Because if you do this, the thing I've talked about is going to throw hundreds of thousands of people out of work. It's going to mean that major cities that are already in trouble, people are going to have less money. I would reverse the capital uh, plans for massive cuts in infrastructure, which the, is the moment in the government for a and I'm afraid I would introduce some new taxes. I don't know how much they would raise, but I am absolutely fed up with non-Dom, Lord Ashcroft type figures who think they can use this country as a nice place. Um, 